Hi, me Dev. It's so great to be here. I've been really enjoying the energy from this room、um, and from this event. I think being surrounded by so many people so passionate about their profession and their craft、uh, is really inspiring to me. All the talks, all the connections, all the conversations. I hope that, like me, you've maybe had some of those moments of inspiration. And let's find out. I mean, give me a cheer if you felt inspired over the past day or two. Okay. I, I can see I, I caught. Thank you. I caught a few by surprise. That's okay. That was a warm up. So do it. And give me a cheer if you felt inspired. There we go. There we go.、Uh, so this talk, by the way, is going to have a few key moments of audience interaction. So keep posted for things like that. So I've got so much admiration for all of you here, and it's from a big, sincere place of admiration that this next bit comes. We've got such an influential group of people here as engineering leaders, but I have some feedback that I need to give to all of us collectively. It's not about any of us individually, but collectively as engineering leaders representing the industry. And obviously, we know feedback can be hard and difficult sometimes. But as Pat rightly pointed out this morning, we know feedback can be a gift. So here it is: big, shocking feedback. We don't have enough diversity in our industry, and that's probably actually not such a shocking thing. Or rather, it's a shocking state of affairs, but not shocking news. It's probably not something which any of you are surprised by me saying as a thing. This desert here, what I'm trying to represent is what it might be like if you are that person who comes from an underrepresented background, and it's an experience which maybe some of you here in this room have, or you know people who've had it. When you are maybe the only person of colour on a team, the only woman on a team, the only LGBTQ person on a team, it's not great. And of course, we know that the industry stats、um, are pretty, pretty something.、Um, where it's like 90 percent, depending on which source you look at, up to 9 percent of software engineers globally are male. And I'm sure that's not really news. To any of you here, and you haven't come to this conference, hear things you already know. It's like, yeah, Richard, we already know this. You're not telling me anything new. I get it. But what I think is interesting is, well, when we're all aware of this as a phenomenon, as a problem, why does it continue to be a problem? The conventional wisdom would have you believe it's a problem because there aren't enough diverse. Tech talent out there. There's not enough diverse tech talent. It's a pipeline problem. You probably know that phrase, and maybe you've experienced it before. You've got a job ad, you put it out, and genuinely, you're like, "I really want to get and source some diverse candidates for this role." And then your experience is it just seems not to come in. It seems like there just isn't that diverse tech talent out there. So this explanation and that term, the pipeline problem, maybe it feels satisfying, maybe it feels neat, but I think there's something important missing from it. The idea of a pipeline problem, in my view, is mostly used as a way sometimes to indicate that the problem is over there. It's nothing to do with us here in industry. It's this pipeline that's leading into industry. It's that pipeline that's the problem, not us. But I don't think that's a narrative that we, as engineering leaders, should accept, because for me, a big part of leadership is about taking ownership, responsibility, and acknowledging agency. And all of us here, as engineering leaders in this room, have the agency to do something about this. Lack of diversity in teams is a complex problem for sure. Of course, there's roots that are deep, complex, social, historical. And in some industries, people may just shrug their shoulders and say, "Look, this problem—it's complex, it's deep, it's social, it's historical. Don't look at me. Nothing I can do about it." That's what they might do in some industries. But we're engineers, and we solve problems and we build the future. If there's any industry that ought to be leading the way on things like this, it ought to be us. And yet, tech remains one of the worst industries for diversity. But solving problems is literally our day job. 
So there's a responsibility, I think, on all of us here as engineering leaders to understand more about this problem and see what we can do about it. And I hope to share with you some suggestions today. So why should you listen to me? Well, I've actually recently uh, started a new startup. Um, it's actually a climate tech startup, so I'm no longer at Academy, but until very recently, I was head of education at Academy, where in my time there, we trained over 100 software engineers with some fantastic diversity outcomes that you can see there. And Academy is just one of the many great organizations I've done this sort of work with. So this image here is from when I was at Multiverse. Uh, I was running a workshop for school leavers. Multiverse, by the way, relatively recently became the UK's first ever edtech unicorn through tech apprenticeships. Other organizations I've worked with include Code Your Future, which historically is focused on getting refugees and asylum seekers into tech, and Black Coder, which runs a free boot camp for black women to get into tech. What I have consistently seen in every single one of these organizations is that getting diverse talent into, debt, into tech delivers great results. For example, at Academy, the software engineers we trained have gone to work for brilliant organizations like Beamery, Darktrace, Soho House, and it's the same story with the other, organi or other organizations. So at Multiverse, it's Starling Bank. At Black Coder, it's KPMG. At Code Your Future, it's Capgemini. So whilst I can't solve the deep, complex, social, historical contributing factors, I am someone who spent quite a lot of time and thought when it comes to recruiting, training, and mentoring underrepresented tech talent with some of the leading, organi leading organizations out there for some incredible tech employers. And so I think I've gained some practical learnings, and that's really fundamentally what I want to share with you today. Before I do that, we're good engineers, so before we jump into the solution, I think it's right we should make sure we understand the problem. So we're going to take a step back and think a bit more about the problem space. Before I was a software engineer, I was a math teacher, as it happens. So you'll have to indulge me, because in this next section, I'm actually going to put my teacher hat back on, use some of my teach techniques, and we're going to see if we can learn something new. We're going to learn about this idea of a talent pyramid. You might be familiar with the idea of a talent pyramid. It's very similar to the idea of an organizational chart, where maybe you've got your CTO at the top, VP Eng, directors of engineering, engineering managers, and as we're going down the chart, we're sort of widening out. You can think of a talent pyramid as an industry-wide version of that. It describes the overall shape of roles in an industry. And so we'd probably expect to have a pretty similar shape to our org chart, where you've got a broader base of talent at the bottom who are new into the industry and sort of narrower at the top with the kind of most senior talent. We're going to look at an example industry, professional services. So by this, I mean things like accountancy and audit. Those are companies like KPMG, EY, Deloitte, PwC, firms like that. They've been around for several decades. And the question is, how many, in a random sample of 100 vacancies, how many of them do you think are for entry-level talent? That is, it's their first job. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to make a prediction. And actually, we're going to do some audience participation here. We're going to try and crowdsource this. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to need you to all either stand up or put your hand up. And we're going to play a game together and see whether wisdom crowds get us somewhere. So you can either stand up or put your hand up as you feel comfortable. And we're going to see where the wisdom of the crowd gets us to. So I've got some hands going up. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, so the way it works, keep your, keep your hand up. Brilliant. I'm going to be counting down from 100, e.g. 90, 80, 70. And you need to keep your hand up until I reach your prediction or lower. 
E.g., if your prediction is it's 25 in 100, you keep your hand up as I say 40, 30. If I say 25 or lower, though, your hand goes down. Is that good? Give me a cheer, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay, we're going to start. I'm going to start counting down. So remember, it's your number or lower. That's when your hand goes down. 100. Okay, you've passed the first test because indeed it is fewer than 100. 90. One hand stand. 80. Some more. 70. A few more. 60. 50. Most hands still up at the moment. 40. Okay, a bit of movement. 30. Okay, that looks like maybe the biggest movement. 25. A few more. 20. 15. Got a few stragglers at the moment. 10. Oh, that was a big jump. Uh, 5. Some holdouts. Two. <laughs> one. As I'll have to, oh, still, still less than one. 0 0.5. 0 0.1. Okay, we've got some positive. Okay, I'll stop it there. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to find out. And because I'm going to reveal the answer, what I need to join me is in a drum roll. So if you could, maybe it's like hands on your laps or something like that. It could be a drum roll. Is that really the answer? Very good. Very good. So the answer is... 23! So I think the room consensus was probably somewhere in the 20 to 30 range, which is pretty good. And 23, as you can see, it's quite a nice, stable pyramid. And these professional service firms, they've been around for a while. They know the deal here. They know how it works. But of course, this is the question we really care about. What's the answer in tech? So we're going to do that again. Make a prediction out of 100, how many of entry level roles, and stick your hands up. And I'm once more going to count down from 100. We're going to see where he lands as a room consensus. Okay, here we go 100, no hands, 90, 80, couple of hands, 70, 60, 50. Okay, we're going definitely much stronger than the last one. 40, a few more. 30, a few more. 25, 20. Okay, a bit of movement. Still a strong group up. 15. Okay, that was the biggest jump so far. 15, 12. Another decent jump. 10. Quite a big jump as well there. 8. 6. Four, quite a big jump at four, two, one. Okay, that's basically everyone. Okay, we're going to find out the answer again. You know what to do, drum roll. Brilliant. The answer is, it's four. Yeah, four. So room consensus was somewhere around, I think, 10 to 15. There are quite a big group at four, actually. I was, I was quite impressed by that. But yeah, it's four in 100, which I was pretty shocked by. And so when people say that tech has a pipeline problem, I say no. Tech doesn't have a pipeline problem. Tech has a pyramid problem. The tech talent pyramid is toppling over. So no wonder we're not significantly increasing diversity in tech, because we're not providing the roots in. If you've only got four out of 100 roles that's suitable for new talent, you can't get diverse new talent into the industry, and it's going to remain broadly the same in diversity stats. And everybody is looking for that engineer with three to five years experience minimum. But that's exactly the behavior that has created our toppling tech talent pyramid. So it's not a pipeline problem, it's a pyramid problem. And that's a pyramid that our industry and our hiring patterns have created. And I understand why it happens. Because we've all got stuff we need to get done, products need to get built, and it's like, oh, if I take on a junior, then you know, I need some seniors to mentor them, and actually, well, my capacity's going to decrease because now my engineers, my seniors aren't building, they're mentoring. I get it. But what happens when we, as engineering teams, we only make short-term decisions? Well, we end up with tech debt. 
So what happens when you only make short-term hiring decisions? We end up with team debt. And not just any team debt. In particular, we end up with a diversity debt. And diversity debt is really, really nasty. Because once it gets out of control, it's very hard to tackle. Imagine you're from one of those underserved, underrepresented backgrounds. You come across a room of maybe eight white men in a team, and it's not great. But if it were 80 white men, 8-0, that's a big sort of red flashing, like, stay away, you're not welcome here sort of thing. It's kind of like coming across a team who may be right only in COBOL. You're like, stay away from me. Like, don't want that. But worse. So if you can't hire diverse talent, it's going to be a real bottleneck on your ability to build teams. So this status quo, our toppling tech, tech talent pyramid, is bad for individuals, it's bad for teams, and it's bad for society. Luckily, there are things you can do to fix this. Ways that you can build high-performing, diverse tech teams that give you a competitive edge. And I'm going to share with you some of the exact same insights that we developed and learned whilst I was head of education at Academy. So our first learning was that talent is actually abundant. And now this might be surprising because we all know hiring is really hard. So if talent's abundant, why is hiring so hard? Well, as engineers, we're really good at pattern recognition. And that's great because if we weren't good at pattern recognition, our code bases, our architecture would be a total mess. So pattern recognition, definitely highly relevant super strength. But when it comes to hiring, pattern recognition can become a limiting behavior. Because we're starting from a position where the industry consists disproportionately of a certain profile. It's a white man who studied computer science at university. And pattern recognition can mean, consciously or subconsciously, when we think about looking for a great engineer, we're looking for the same sort of profile. White man did computer science. So that same pattern recognition behavior is now possibly introducing bias and holding us back in our efforts to find great talent. And pattern recognition can in some ways lead to things like this. I'll leave this up for a second. We've probably come across memes like this before. And it's not the exact same sort of problem, but I think all of us have had that experience where we're like, actually, you know what? Tech recruitment sometimes can feel really, really broken. I mean, in this case, at least they're not asking for COBOL, but still, it's like, not great. So all of this serves as gatekeeping. It keeps out a whole bunch of people who've not had the same opportunities to get the skills and experience. And those people are disproportionately women, black, or from other underserved backgrounds. And for what gain? Why do we do this? As a bit of gatekeeping people out of the industry, the tech talent pyramid is crumbling behind us. So we need to change our mindset to hiring. Rather than gatekeeping, we should be building bridges into the industry, finding a way to get more talent and more diversity in. So what would happen if we took a radically more inclusive approach to hiring? As all of us know, engineering is a lot about continuous learning. So what if we recruited on the basis of learning velocity instead of experience? Well, you would immediately be able to access a far wider and more diverse pool of talent. And this is what I mean when I talk about an abundance of talent. When you focus on learning velocity, you're not limited to the profiles that are already out there that have already had an opportunity. But you can look around and see what, other el what else there is out there, and it turns out there's a lot of people who are really smart, driven, and curious. Here's four example profiles of people that we worked with at Academy. You'll see that zero of them had computer science degrees. 
all of them, though, had that drive, that curiosity, that commitment. And so what we did at Academy was we picked them for their, we picked them for their potential, and then we trained them for the tech skills. And we actually invested in them. So it's now over 100 of these people who, by the way, don't pay any training fees. We pay them a grant whilst they're training. So we generally make an investment in them because we see that they can learn and they can grow and they can become great engineers and technical talent. And it delivers great results. So these are all the organizations where Academy Town is now working at. I'm going to go on a brief tangent now, uh, but you'll understand hopefully why soon. I wonder how many of us can really sort of viscerally remember a time for DevOps. Because sometimes to me it feels like actually, you know, it's been around forever. It's very wide in the way that we think about things now. But actually, of course, it's not always been around. And moving to DevOps practices was a shift for industry, a big investment for industry, but something that was key to allowing a lot of scale and growth. It's way harder to ship great products if you don't have a right DevOps practices. But it's also way harder to ship great products that serve a diverse audience if we can't scale our engineering teams in a way which embeds diversity at its core. Something like deployment is no longer such a bottleneck to effective engineering teams, but hiring diverse talents is still a bottleneck. And so just like we had a DevOps revolution that changed engineering infrastructure practices, we need a dev ed revolution, developer education, to change our engineering talent practices. DevOps has things like our continuous integration pipelines. Dev ed is about the continuous development pipelines that bring in that diverse talent that maybe haven't had the same opportunities, but they've got high growth, they've got high potential, and educating them and making sure they get the skills they need to be your great engineers. We need to reconstruct that toppling tech talent pyramid. And it's an imperative, not just for rep representation and diversity, but for the long-term health of our, of our industry. Because that talent pyramid is going to collapse if we don't do something about it. Now, I've promised some practical tips, and here they are. My first tip is around volunteering. Sign yourself up and your team to do some external mentoring. We talk a lot sometimes about internal mentoring, which is great for growing internal talent, but it's actually only external mentoring that's going to help us broaden that base of our pyramid. And for me, part of this is important where recognizing the opportunities that all of us are lucky to have inside engineering and thinking about, well, can we extend that ladder out to others? There's also lots of other great benefits because when you mentor externally, you get to build relationships with some of this diverse talent and see how they are and see how they learn and get some really rich information from that. And it's also a really important part of leadership because the people who are underserved and under underrepresented in tech face a whole different wave of challenges compared to others. And as a leader, we need to be able to understand the challenges that our people face and help support them through it. So when you externally mentor and expose yourself to maybe demographics which you might not otherwise be encountering, you can grow in your practice as a leader as well. And all these organizations here all have great mentoring opportunities if you want to learn more about them, let me know. My next tip for hiring is seek potential. As engineering leaders, part of our responsibility is to make sure we're building not just for today, but also for tomorrow. And it's the same mindset here in hiring. As we grow our engineering organization, we'll need engineers who grow with us. So don't be focused on the static profile of an individual at this snapshot, this point in time. But think about what's their trajectory been like and where could they go? And this is particularly important when it comes to hiring juniors. And it's important we be hiring juniors because that's the only way we're going to fix this talent pyramid. So when you look at a junior, 
See if you can proxy into how they've grown and developed over the past few months. Can you see that evidence of rapid growth? One way I like to do this is to give them a tech test that involves them learning something new. So maybe it's a new engineering pattern, a library they haven't used, a new API, whatever. But this gives you a really granular look into how quickly can they learn and lets you really map out their potential. Other things you can do is do pair programming exercise with them. And then, of course, you can see how coachable they are. When it comes to scaling your engineering teams, my top tip is to invest in dev ed capability. This is pretty much the only reliable and replicable way to build diverse tech teams because of this pyramid problem. When the current tech workforce is so lacking in diversity, you can only hire diverse talent if you're building new routes into the industry. And there's an exciting opportunity there to invest in high growth, homegrown talent. And you can make a big difference thinking at a cohort level. For example, at Academy, we'd often have conversations with companies to be thinking about, well, what if we took 10, 20, 40 people from an underserved background and we gave them as a cohort an opportunity as junior software engineers? And it's a lot of work. I'm not saying it's easy because you need to, you're putting a lot into these people and you want to know that, well, we're investing time and resources into them. I want to know that they're going to stay with the organization. I want to know that they're going to learn, that they're going to be able to keep up with the pace. So sure, it's, I'm not saying this is easy, but it's something which we've seen lots of organizations are looking at as a competitive edge because this builds their reliable long-term talent pipeline. It's something which is entirely possible to build internally. There's a couple of different ways you can do that that are interesting. So one way to build it internally is you think about a dedicated team where you might have a role as software engineering coach, say, where that person's full-time role pretty much is in kind of training and coaching your emerging talent. So that's one way you can do that. There's also an interesting part-time model where you have your existing engineers who give up maybe half a day a week to do those sorts of activities. And actually, that's a really like, rewarding experience for them to do as well. So two interesting models there if you want to do it internally. And then, of course, you can partner with external organizations if there's parts which you feel like you don't have the expertise or time for, whether that is getting access to the sort of diverse communities where you want to find the talent or doing the training itself and then you can benefit from still having that cohort of diverse junior software engineers. And in doing all of this, we leave behind a failing system and our broken talent pyramid. Our broken talent pyramid makes hiring phenomenally difficult, and it's such a bottleneck on scaling our engineering teams. But where buying talent is competitive, building talent can be a competitive advantage. Diverse teams perform better, and homegrown talent is more loyal. So this is a great way to build and retain and grow a diverse, high-performing team. And ultimately, aside from all the genuine commercial benefits, this is going to be what builds us a more diverse, inclusive, and equitable industry. As the engineering leaders of today, it's our responsibility to think about who the engineering leaders of tomorrow will be. And I hope that you'll join with me in working to make that group as diverse as possible. That's all from me. Thank you so much. Um, if there's anything which I've discussed which you'd like to talk more about, all my details here, I'm always very happy to chat on these things. Thank you so much. You've been an amazing audience. Thank you for your participation as well. Appreciate it.